Hey, welcome to the Diary of a New Producer, the weekly series that we produce here at the Max Revenue Show that gives you a behind the curtain look into the life of a new producer starting from scratch, Ian Cognito. The cool part is it gives you the perspective of both a mentor and a mentee, right? So my name is Micah Salas. I am the host and the mentor of Ian Cognito. Let's get into this, folks. Thanks again for joining us. We got a really good week here, week number eight. Hard to believe time flies, right? Um, but what we're going to talk about this week is six different things. I'm going to talk about flexibility, why it's the best thing ever, hot prospects. We've already done due diligence, how to respond to that. We're going to talk about markets, market knowledge. We're going to talk about not being a fit for everyone and carrying that mindset into your calls and everything you do. And lastly, nice prospects and why they suck. All right, so first things first, numbers last week for Ian, only 55 calls made. That kind of stinks, right? Remember the goal's 200 or somewhere close to that? Well, again, I've talked about this in previous meetings, life happens, right? For Ian, he's got three kids, his family came in town on Wednesday. They went down to the valley to hang out with some uh, family and see some, you know, his his brother play football, stuff like that. And guess what? I don't care as his mentor. I don't care. That's the beautiful part about being an insurance agent. This is topic number one: flexibility, right? I think we all talk and get wrapped up in in, in the cost side of things, or not cost, the amount of money that we can make, right? That's awesome. But for me personally, the greatest part about being a producer is the integration of work and life. There really is no work-life balance. It is in a weird way, that whole word balance, it just is one for me. And it's hard to explain. I get up, I take my daughter to school at 9 a.m. I pick her up at two, I come back, get done what I gotta get done, make some calls, I'm checking my email. That's just life, right? Now, some people wanna shut it off on the weekend, that's fine. I don't really get weekend calls, but if a client wants to call me on a weekend, go for it. I don't care. I'll take the call all day long. Cause it's just life, just like if my brother called me or whoever called me. Um, and, and if you don't want to operate that way, that's totally fine. Again, it's your business to run. But for me personally, the reason I like being a producer is just, it's just one, right? And it just feels fun that way. Um, now, remember this though, to whom much is given, much is required. And Ian crushed it because he really made calls for two days and made 55 calls, right? So he did pretty well. Um, and he set a meeting with a really nice contractor for a 2-1-X date. It's not even October 1st, folks. He is working out ahead following the system, okay? So important. All right, let's talk about hot prospects. I don't mean how people look, but I mean hot ones that are ripe for the picking. And there's no hotter prospect in my opinion, and Ian and I talked about this, than a change of CFOs, change of new controller comes in town, new CFO. Ian had been calling someone for a while, the guy's like, hey, yeah, I just moved over to this company, I've done due diligence in the past, haven't even looked at it here. What better way to bring in value to a, a, a prospect than to say, hey, man, since you're new, I, I'm not, I don't really want to quote, but I'd be happy to just do a, a review, some due diligence for you, provide you a report, right? No strings attached. I'd love to be hired, of course, but, you know, again, you'd have this great opportunity to show value to these people, right? And, and when they're new, any new CFO wants to put their own uh, imprint on that business, right? And they want to make their mark. And so take advantage of that. Uh, obviously, if you see people hop around on LinkedIn, hit them up, okay? I'm sure a lot of other people are too, right? But hey, don't don't not do it just because you think a lot of other people are doing it. You might be surprised how many people are actually um, reaching out to that new CFO. All right, so um, third thing we're going to talk about this week out of the six, we've already done due diligence. You know, maybe you're making cold calls and you get this one. Hey, we've already done due diligence. We don't need to do it. Great. Can you, what did that look like? That's your response, guys. That is how you respond. What did that look like? Can you describe? Because chances are they haven't done the due diligence that we talk about here at the Max Revenue Show or that you're talking about, right? Uh, they might have done a policy review. They might have quoted their insurance with several agents. That's maybe a sliver of due diligence, but that's not really a full uh, market assessment. It's not really benchmarking. It's not really an assessment of... Uh, their overall cost of risk, right? And those factors that play into that, their uh, risk transfer agreements, 
their HR manual, not an analysis of their losses, their EMR. It's not you know any of that stuff, that due diligence. It's not a conversation around uh, best practices, what they're doing, what they're not doing. So um, it's a great way when someone says this to confirm and just come back, well, hey, that sounds great. What did, you, what did that look like for you? You'll be surprised and it might continue the conversation on further. That's the whole... One thing I think that is so critical is the art of continuing a conversation, right? Because there's those points in a conversation that just seems like, hmm, it's dead. And you have a decision to make. You have to, in a moment, be able to continue that conversation. And nothing can prep you for it other than real life experience, I think, right? Role playing can kind of help a little bit. But I think having those experiences to just know when to ask that right question that continues that conversation just a little bit longer. All right. Um, so... The next thing to talk about is, or that Ian and I talked about, is market conditions, right? He set a new meeting with a, a large electrical contractor. Awesome. We talked about that. What's it going to look like? And he asked me some questions about coverages, right? I know this this channel and a lot of content online is more driven on, on like salesmanship and marketing, but I still think there's some room for talking coverages, especially as a mentor. So if you're going to find a mentor, talk to hopefully find a mentor who knows your industry a little bit. We talk about niching. I don't think you need to be micro niche down. I think there's generalists who are excellent, right? Um, I think it's more of a marketing play, the niche route. But, uh, you know, uh, Ian and I talked specifically about this one. I'm in contractor, so I was like, hey, you know, this is how it works. Oh, that carrier's on the work comp. Is that common? He asked me. I said, yeah, actually it is because that carrier used to just say, hey, we don't need the work comp, but now they're wanting the whole piece of the puzzle, right? They want the whole pie, work comp's profitable. So we just talked about things like that. I'm not going to get into the specifics here because I think for purposes of YouTube, um, you know, there's a lot of people watching this that don't need to know specifics. But the, the message I would say is lean on your mentor for their marketing knowledge. Ask them those types of questions like, hey, how is this structured? What other players are in this space, right? And then we talked about how, hey, if this starts to progress, I can provide them some of my data that I did on due diligence in the past for other electrical contractors, that could be great reference points for you. So um, that was you know, the main point of this, um, you know, which kind of leads into the next point to a certain sense, because point number five is, hey, I'm not a fit for everyone. And Ian said this to me, right? Uh, and he said, coming from this mindset has just freed him up so much. He had a meeting that was supposed to happen last week. The guy kind of blew him off. And he's just like, hey, that's okay, you know. And the guy's like, could, could we do next Monday or next Thursday? And he's like, actually, it doesn't work. And then they had to reschedule it for this week. And he's like, it kind of felt weird saying that, but he's like, it felt kind of empowering. I'm like, yeah, and you're not being a, an a-hole about it, right? You're being professional, but you're just respecting your own time as well. And so understanding when we're not a fit for everyone mindset is you aren't a fit for everyone, right? And the buying process is a two-way street. It's the buyer and it's you, it's gotta be a mutual fit for both people. And if at any time you feel like, man, this client would be an absolute waste of my time or my team's time, or they'd be disrespectful, abort, cut out, right? Just tell the guy like, hey, I don't think we're a fit. Um, so really, really critical to understand that. And one other point I wanna mention on this is, um, you can have this conversation at a first meeting, but also throughout the due diligence process, if you learn some things that just don't jive with you, I, like I said, abort, right? Um, but, but one other point on this due diligence that I wanted to make is, man, it is a win-win for everyone, right? I know you win-win gets abused and abused, but the reason I say that is, um, let's say you do the due diligence and you get a no, you hopefully, now you learned, right? You had a chance to review another policy without having to quote an investor team's time, but you had a chance to review the policy. You had a chance to gain market knowledge. You had a chance to gain rate knowledge in your location for that niche. You take all that with you for the next deal, right? Now you just be you just sharpened your saw. So there's no downside to it. And you didn't have to waste all your time quoting, filling out apps, doing all the administrative stuff, the back and forth, getting lost. Or none of that. But you gained a lot from it. Okay. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is nice prospects and why they absolutely suck. All right, so Ian has this 1031. He's been calling the lady every time she talks to him. Yeah, I'd love to do the due diligence. What do you, you know, I'll get you what you need. Here we are. It's been like, we're on week eight. I think this has been happening since week one. Still doesn't have anything. Nada. Zilch, right? And um, I think, you know, Ian was like, what should I do? I was like, man, 
have you heard of Chris Voss, the give up email? And he's like, yeah, I sent it last week. I said, well, you can't just send another email now because you, you, that's just kind of, you know, we talked about that. I'm not a fit for everyone, not being desperate, not selling from a place of desperation. If you give in now, you kind of just, you know, you make yourself look like a bozo. Not saying it matters what other people think necessarily, but there has to be a point when you draw that line, you, you don't send that email unless you're ready to cut it, right? And I said, what I would do is you send that email, silence, don't respond. The renewal's coming up 1031. What I would do is reach out that week. Hey, how'd it go? If they still don't respond, put them out for six more months and then follow up and kind of work your deal for 2024. But to the point of nice prospects suck, this is why nice prospects suck because they're nice people, you like them, but they can't tell you no. And whether it's timing, whether it's they have a good relationship or they don't have buying power, whatever, just tell me the truth, man. That's all I want to know. So uh, this is why I've grown to love mean prospects. I think they're awesome. And why nice prospects have kind of just over the years, like, ah, they just frustrate me, right? Um, I, so if you can try to sniff this out in that first meeting, that's critical because you don't want to invest your time. And you don't want to get all your hopes and dreams up over these prospects who are just wasting your time. So what I told Ian, I was like, man, give, give her, if you catch her on the phone again, like what, whatever time it is, where what you know retroactively if i could look back two three weeks and when you caught her last what i would have said is like hey nancy you know you've been you've been saying you know maybe you ask them hey do you want to still do the due diligence yeah i'd love to i'll get it to you be like hey that's great I, let me just ask you though i, I kind of want to make sure if nancy if if you really don't want to do it or it seems like maybe timing's an issue or it's not a priority or maybe you have a strong relationship with your other agent you can just tell me that like no hard feelings on my end. I'll I'll back off um, and let this thing go. So just give them an out. And then, and if they, you know, hopefully that kind of helps get these people off the fence for you, right? All right, well, that is all I got for you. So I hope you found value this week. If you did, make sure you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel, uh, check us out on LinkedIn. And if you haven't yet, go check out the new producer playbook. It's a course we built that helps you build a million dollar pluck plus plus book of business, find financial freedom, all that fun stuff. And um, we'll keep doing this, guys. So good luck out there. Uh, hit us up in the comments if you have any questions. Thanks.